Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased to be joined by our entertainment pundit, Michael Nichols Pate, for this very special edition of the show. We are so pleased and actually very honored to have our guest onto the show today. He is coming off of his stint as director of The Kite Runner on Broadway. He is writer and director, Giles Croft. Giles, welcome to the show. Hello, lovely to be here. So, Giles, before we get into the big, uh, the big crux of the whole conversation, I've asked every theater person who has ever come on this show the exact same question. Michael is laughing right now because he knows what the question is about to be. Yep. You're no exception. <laughs> what does theater mean to you? Oh, um, well, I suppose that, uh, well, I'm on very simple level. It's been most of my life so in that sense it means pretty much everything uh, uh <laughs> but uh, the most important thing to me i suppose is that it's a it's a, a community space and it's a wonderful space where people can engage in uh shared experience it's it's an old idea but it doesn't make it any less true um so it's extraordinarily valuable and one of the most interesting things i think about uh theater's relationship to what's happened in the last few years uh is that when people have come back to it they've been so passionate about re-engaging and that's been uh, a, a welcome and a necessary thing i would say but that's probably the best answer i can give well, I like best answers that you can give, especially for a podcast. I, I want to turn, though, <laughs> to the start, to the start of the journey that is Giles Croft. And I want to know, what was your introduction into the theater? Was there a Broadway show? Was there a West End show that you first saw and that sparked the creativity of being a writer and director in the, broad, in the theater uh, world? Or did it just come naturally to you? When I was young... Uh, I was taken to see pantomimes uh, by my parents and uh, I was brought up in the UK and in the West Country, so in a town called Bath, which some people may know because they visited as tourists, I guess, um, uh, or they read Jane Austen. And uh, I, something about that experience uh, I found absolutely thrilling. And there were there were actually three things I can remember really specifically about it that, that I carry with me today, really strong feelings. Uh, one was uh, the proximity to people performing, uh, just being that close to people being other people. Um, and I found that thrilling and I remember it so clearly. Uh, the second thing was the smell of theatre. I can still smell those shows. Um, in those days, scenery was painted using size. Uh, the glue was made size and the smell was so strong and I can feel it, uh, smell it, but also feel it in the back of my nose now when I talk about it. So that... Uh, and then the third thing about it was the excitement of being with my family at this experience. Uh, it, it was a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing. So, so that carried me with me as I grew older. Uh, it didn't turn into anything particularly, uh, I, I guess, as an idea for me until I worked for a short time for my uncle. This is not going where you thought, probably. Not, not one bit, but uh, I enjoy fantastic. this. Because I, I actually want to ask one question before you finish that story. Yeah, what does yeah. theater smell like to you? Because you just said you remember the smell. So what does that that first theater smell? Do you, you Since you remember, oh. describe it. Okay, so uh, one, it's, uh, it's uh, mysterious. And I mean by that, I couldn't place it anywhere else. It was a, a smell I only ever smelled in the theatre. Two, um, it would get to the back of my nose and sort of sit there, and it was there all the way through, all the way through the show. And it wasn't an unpleasant smell, but it wasn't a it wasn't a sweet smell. Uh, and size, of course, is is made. I think I say, of course, it's it's boiling down horses. So. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, uh, and uh, it has a really, it's quite pungent, uh, I guess. So I can smell that. And I still, if I go backstage, which I do often in theatres, that sense of it comes back to me, just the sense of it. Um, uh, so that's what it smells like to me. So uh, thank what, you for yeah. answering that. But what now? Now let's talk about your uncle because yes, this was <laughs> this was not the way that the interview was going to go. But here we are. This is the great thing about my show: it goes whatever <laughs> direction the guest takes it in. So what about your uncle? So my uncle uh, had a handmade chocolate business. Also something I associate with smell very much. I'd never thought about this before, uh, and. Um, the business was uh, in London and uh, we had every Christmas and Easter, etc. They would come down bringing chocolates with them, him, my uncle and aunt. Um, and when I was about 16, maybe, I went and worked one summer up at the shop making handmade chocolates. And I'd probably known it before, but I wasn't. I don't remember being told this, but it, certainly when we were there, he told me that he'd once been an actor and a playwright. Uh, and I'd only known him as somebody who made chocolate. Um, and I spent quite a long time talking to him about the experience of it and the, his successes and failures and et cetera, et cetera. And when I left, he said to me, do you know you'd make a good actor? Uh, and... Uh, I went away from that thinking, oh, well, there's an idea. Maybe I could be an actor. Um, I act, but I'm no actor. And I never trained to be an actor. Um, uh, but that was that was the point at which I sort of connected this sort of happy memory, if you like. And I'd been to the theatre in between times. It wasn't I hadn't been to the theatre. But him saying, could you be, an, you know, maybe you could be an actor. Uh, obviously he didn't want me to work in the chocolate business because I was obviously useless. So, <laughs> so um, the, uh, and that's where it, it started, I guess. Um, and I initially, I mean, having thought about, you know, as I say, being an actor and doing some amateur dramatics and finding out that I wasn't really very good and I couldn't remember lines, um, uh, that... Uh, actually writing's like a good idea because he'd also been a playwright and uh, so I started writing and actually that's where it started I um, got some work on the radio and a couple of things published and uh, I was about 19 at the time and uh, then somebody asked me to write some plays for a youth theatre which I did and I hung around the youth theatre and was in rehearsals quite a lot and thought oh this directing thing this seems quite good to me. Uh, so, so that's how it started. Yeah. Boiling down horses and chocolate. As someone who's heavily involved in the theater, I definitely agree with the smell of theaters and, and the smell around. It does trigger a weird kind of mysterious sort of sense memory, especially backstage. Oh, Not yeah. really can't does. put your finger on it. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and the smells are different now, but they're there. They're absolutely there. And I love, one of the things I love about tech, funnily enough, uh, a technical rehearsal is when the painter's coming. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, that's a wonderful thing. And I always hang around for a bit whilst they're painting because there's something magical about that. And when I worked in theatre uh, in buildings uh, full time, I would spend quite a lot of time in the paint shop with the painters because I always found that very exciting. There you go. Well, excellent. <laughs> Do you have a question, Michael, before I yeah. ask? Go ahead. So, so 1985, you get appointed as director of, artistic director of the Gate Theatre. Uh, how long had you been doing theatre up to that point? Uh, well, I suppose if I take my experiences at the youth theatre as the start okay. of it, um, that was when I was around 19 I started doing that. I didn't go to university. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd been working in shops and, as I say, doing a little bit of writing here and there and trying to work out what to do and, uh, and a bit of amateur dramatics. And it was really the point at which I got this uh, I'm going to call it a commission to write a play for the youth theatre. 
uh, that I would mark as the start of my relationship. So yeah, I think I was 19 when I did that. Um, uh, and between that and going to the gate, uh, I'd worked, uh, I then worked full time at this youth theatre, it was a youth art centre really. Um, and I ended up running it. So when I was 21, they asked me if I would run it. Uh, and there was an art gallery and a cafe and all sorts of things. We used to have a punk cafe, which they made a TV program about. Uh, it's where the sniffing glue uh, started. Uh, the... <laughs> Giles, I was not going to oh. mention it. You talk about you're standing around waiting for the paint to dry. You're talking about sniffing glue. People are going to get a wrong yeah, impression of you here, man. It's coming <laughs> Um, so yeah, we had a, we had a punk cafe which they and there was a program on the BBC about it, uh, which was rather fabulous. Um, uh, and then I started to do work in other theatres in Bath, a bit of writing, a bit of directing, a bit of administration. Um, moved to London, had a show that uh, went to London, um, uh, and then whilst I was there, I started to concentrate on what at those days was rather clumsy called um, neglected European classics. Uh, 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 there were an awful lot of plays that weren't being done in the UK. We were so interested in our canon rather than the world canon. And there were a group of us who started to look at this work in more detail. And um, it was really because of that that I came to the gate which had an international focus for its repertoire unlike any other theatre in London at the time uh, so we it was a sort of natural partnership if you like uh, and it was uh, yeah that's how I ended up fantastic do you consider yourself lucky because someone at 19 <laughs> no and I apologize if I sound if that sounds like an inconsiderate <laughs> question it's, it's just I, I don't a very I don't, reasonable question I don't imagine a lot of 19 year olds are getting artistic director jobs at a theater play or getting jobs like you did, because you look at your trajectory from where you started to where you are now, you, I'm sorry, but you are a lucky son of a gun here, mister, because <laughs> I'm looking at it because I, I can imagine there's a lot of people who are 19 right now, even Michael, who would love to, direct a show on broadway not only the west end in london like you have been to the places where a lot of theater directors and writers would love to even attempt to go and you've done it yeah i i would consider myself lucky uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> easiest answer <laughs> ever i've heard yeah 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 um i i i think there's a really significant difference between what happened to what what could happen when I was you know 19, 20, 25, whatever, up until I was about 40, I would have say, 45. Um, and what happens now? You know, you could you could be in the right place at the right time uh, and get a job without going back through a whole process without having to go through a whole complicated process um and so uh, uh, certainly the first third of my career um i think was as much about that as anything else uh you know i just happened to be doing the right things in the right place at the right time things fell into place for me and people would say well, come and do this then. And I go, yeah, all right, that's great. Thanks very much. I, I think now an awful lot of that would have to go, well, uh, we'd like you to do this, but could you fill out this form and do this and do that? And, you know, what are your qualifications? Um, I, nobody's ever asked me if I had qualifications to do what I do, really, other than the work I'd done. Uh, and I'm not trying to suggest it was a better time. Uh, you know, it's not about whether, you know, we are where we are now just so happens at that time, uh, it was possible for people to do it. And it, and I think, you know, there are plenty of other people as talented as me, some more talented, uh, who didn't have the luck. I can look back at people who I admired very much and wonder what happened to them. It just didn't work out. Um, I had some skills, uh, this is aside from my directing, um, I had some skills that 
that eased my way through, which I acquired through not having gone to university. I acquired management skills, uh, administrative skills, financial skills that gave me a sufficient grounding to feel comfortable working in buildings and be able to talk to people across the organization and in management. And there are an awful lot of very talented people um, you know, who didn't have those skills. Um, and had they had them, they may well have had better careers than they did. They might have had careers. Some of them didn't have careers at all, to be quite honest. Um, so I think uh, I, my grounding was a sort of practical one, not a theoretical one. And that served me very well. Um, yeah, no question. Michael, whenever you're ready, next, you can ask the next question if you have one. If not, then I'll just throw my next question in. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of more a technical side of directing as a whole. What do you find is your biggest challenge when working with casts to develop a show? <laughs> okay. We ask the tough questions here on the cross-border yeah. interviews with Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would say... Um, Okay, it's changed over the years. But, sure. Uh, uh, so it used to be the case, I thought, that it was convincing them that they had to uh, believe me. Uh, and uh, you'd come up with all sorts of elaborate ways of trying to get them to believe you. Um, uh, and uh, I think the the shift that happened at some point, or I mean, it wasn't, you know, day like this, day like that, uh, it, you know, it happened over a time and it was probably continuing now, uh, was the challenge actually uh, became more a personal one, uh, 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 actually about, um, not about convincing them that I was right, uh, but about uh, being convinced in myself that I could be wrong. Um, uh, and that, uh, opening up a dialogue with the company in a way that allows for errors of judgment or rethinking. But at the same time, and this is the challenge of it, uh, ensuring that the guidelines within which you work are shared. So that what you're not trying to do is tell everybody to do everything. But what you are trying to say is, okay, there's A and there's Z or Z, whatever you want to call it. Um, but we're not going that far. We're going between you know D and F. And I want you to join me in that space. And in that space, we will explore together. Um, and, and so I think that's the shift, I mean, really, uh, for me. And so the challenge is going into that room and over the first few days, encouraging people to trust that the parameters I'm setting are the correct ones. You know, they can be challenged and they can shift around a bit. Fundamentally, that's what the, the challenge is. Uh, and on the whole, that works. There are often, you know, occasions where it's tougher than others, but, but fundamentally that works. It made it easier. It made it easier, you know. That the the business of when you're really not confident and you walk into a room and you think, okay, I just have to do this, and they'll, you know, I've got to stand my ground. Well, that creates all sorts of problems. Um, yeah. So we just have over here with our very short-lived prime minister. That was exactly the approach she took. You know, uh, I'm oh, not Liz confident, Truss. so I was really tough. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, there are a lot of Liz Trusses going into rehearsal rooms. But uh, thankfully, the rehearsal room uh, only keeps you in place for three to four weeks. So, you know, yeah. you can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to throw to the anyway. big I want to throw to the big subject that we brought you on to talk about, because I'm just cautious of time here. We're, and that is the kite runner. You are, yeah. as of this airing, you are coming off of a successful, I, I'm going to say successful uh, show on Broadway. You have been with the Kite Runner production since, the, from what I understand, 2013. Please correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm incorrect on that statement. But what drew you to the Kite Runner? Because I've read uh, the Kite Runner. I've, I haven't seen the show, but Michael has, and I've read his review. And from what I understand, you do a fantastic job as director getting 
the best out of your uh, actors, even though we just talked about the, the acting part a few seconds ago, what drew you to this play and this story so much from your background that you read it and you said, I need to do this. This is, this is the show that I want to do. Okay, so um, I was at that time the artistic director of a theatre in Nottingham, Nottingham Playhouse. Um, and uh, when you're the director of a theatre, you're spending an awful lot of your time trying to work out what's a good show to do and what will sell tickets. Um, uh, but uh, one of the things that the Nottingham Playhouse has, and certainly had then and, and still has today, is a commitment to um, producing work of a sort of from the world repertoire to some degree. Uh, it's it's a neat combination between you know, the, the exploring ideas beyond our shores and at the same time encouraging people to write new plays about the UK. Um, and so looking for work that could sell tickets that tells other people's stories, you know, part of what made that job appealing to me. And it goes back to why I was appointed to the gate, to be honest. You know, that sort of worldview. Um, and I'd never read the current one. Uh, but uh, funnily enough, I was in Edmonton. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, visiting the theatre there. And the theatre had been run by somebody called John Neville, who had been my one of my predecessors at Nottingham. Uh, and so I'd gone there on a sort of pilgrimage, really. Sorry, I apologize uh, to interrupt. Are you talking about the Alberta Jubilee or are you talking about another theater? If you remember, if not, then don't worry. I, I can't remember the name of the theater off the top of my head. I'm okay. so sorry. Uh, Every I'm Calgarian Edmonton, Edmontonian is turning off their because you can't remember it. I'm sorry. Joking. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's, it's it's a producing theatre in Edmonton, and it's a very nice theatre, and, and uh, the, the artistic director there was delightful. Um, and we were just talking. I was just talking about what I did and this, that, and the other. And behind him, there was a poster for the Kite Runner, which was being co-produced between theatre in Calgary uh, and uh, theatre in uh, Edmonton. And... Um, I just asked to read the script. It's as simple as that. And I read it and loved it. I thought it was such a good story. And uh, the whole issue, uh, 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 the issue at the heart of it, uh, uh, really, uh, is the immigrant experience. Uh, and you know, clearly it's about all sorts of other things, but that sort of journey from one country to another, how you cope with that, what your relationship is to that, to your history, all of that, uh, you know, made it particularly resonant, it seemed to me, uh, uh, because Nottingham is uh, uh, one of those places where refugees end up in the UK. Um, there's a large immigrant community, there's a large Afghan community there, uh, and I thought, OK, this is a great story to tell in Nottingham, to be quite honest. Uh, and, uh, you know, then you add into that the fact that it's the novel itself, uh, which is very powerful, is weak enough as a piece of writing to be adaptable. That's not a criticism. It's a first novel. You know, you read a second novel, Thousand Splendid Sons, and it's a better piece of writing. Are much harder to adapt. Uh, the Kite Runner, you know, has just got enough flexibility in it for it to, uh, um, yeah, to, to welcome a, a theatrical adaptation. It also has qualities of Dickens about it. It's got vivid characterization. It's got, um, you know, strong narrative. It's got uh, a, a sort of political heart to it that's very strong, you know, and, and I thought, okay, well, this is great storytelling. It's just great storytelling, actually. Um, and we did it in 2013, uh, and it was very successful. Uh, we toured it the following year uh, in the UK. Uh, it then went to the West End. We had two seasons in the West End. Um, then we were touring again. And all the while, the idea of Broadway was sort of mooted, but it was never really feasible. And at that point, the idea was to take the UK company over. 
Um, so we would have had the UK company who would have come out of the West End and then we'd look to take that show to America, tour it, and then maybe do Broadway. Um, but it just was too awkward, too expensive, never quite made sense to anybody. Then we hit the pandemic. Uh, and a whole bunch of things happened during that period that suddenly made it more plausible. Uh, uh, but what became impossible was to take the UK company. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, when things reopened, the, the political climate was different, really. Af we had the terrible events in Afghanistan that happened, so there was a sort of raised awareness of all of that. Um, the need for greater representation uh, on the stages uh, was there, so again it became politically more uh, uh, important for a show that that uh, had such a, a significant representation for what is now called a main a Middle Eastern and North African performance. Um, and but we couldn't bring the UK company because there was no way, as Broadway was reopening, were they going to really sanction a completely UK company of that sort coming over. So suddenly it turned into a Broadway show. Uh, it was very short notice, really, when it happened. Uh, and thrilling. Throw it over to you, Michael. Yes. Yeah, so, so with kind of bringing it over, you said that the pandemic kind of made things a little easier for its transition. Could you possibly elaborate if you can on what some of those what some of that was well um i think that the well the, the first thing really was that that i think the the awareness of afghanistan you know the the american and british bungling of of, of the afghan mm -hmm. issue for want of a better word um i think just made it uh well it sounds terrible but but it sort of raised people to sort of awareness and interest in what happened um and also people began to recognize that there was a sort of culpability that we all had in all of this uh, uh and that uh maybe it wasn't quite so much somebody else's story uh maybe there was something about us in here that we needed to explore it also meant there were some changes made to the script with Hussein's blessing which just heightened that sense of responsibility. Sorry, I want to interject yeah. here for a second here, Giles, because that's that's an interesting point, and I want to jump on that. You Americanized the story because you Americanized it from the West End to Broadway because you talked about how you changed the blessing from what it was to what it was on Broadway. How important was it for you to Americanize? And I say that as in uh, taking a show from the West End and bringing it to America, some of the language, some of the culture, some of the changes Americans are only going to, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus here, Michael. I'm just trying to be honest here. <laughs> but sometimes when you bring something into America, you have to Americanize it so Americans can understand it. How, how challenging was it for you as the director to look at the American audience and say, okay, they're not going to get this part, but we have to change it for this? Uh, funnily enough, it was the other way around, really. Really? So, uh, yeah, yeah, because what happened was that um, we anglicised it. So when we brought it to the UK, when we did it in the UK, we took stuff out and changed some of the references and uh, made some adjustments to uh, some of the scenes that, because we felt that it was it, it wouldn't sit in the UK quite as comfortably. Um, and so when it, we were taking it back, effectively, to, to America, we put some of that stuff back in. Um, but also uh, we talked to the adapter about other changes and effectively to Khaled Hosseini about other changes that could be made that would uh, heighten some of the issues. So uh, the best example I can think of is that um in uh, you've not seen it but in the in the sort of final scene between the uh, antagonist and amir so asif and amir where there's the fight uh, uh um 
uh, there's a, we introduced a section which was about the the motivation part of his motivation well, maybe the word but i'm going to use it part of his motivation for getting involved with the taliban the the, the antagonists motivation for doing that uh, and how they were supported by the cia um and and that was something that we wanted and Khaled was happy to introduce and we felt okay we can heighten that rather than just making an out and out baddie two-dimensional we can introduce some stuff which just makes him a little more complex and places the american not just american but the west uh as uh in some way responsible for creating an environment where this thing could happen um so so that was the process really it was partly returning stuff we'd taken out and then just heightening certain stuff in american um the other they, but the real difference actually between the UK uh, and uh, the American production was uh, was the acting. That's the real difference. I would say that um, the on the whole, UK actors are intellectually uh, driven more than emotionally driven. You know, they, they find it quite hard to access emotions, and they will do a lot of thinking. Uh, and then you have to encourage them to be emotion. It's completely the opposite in America. Um, you know, the actors I'm not will... sure if that was a dig at American actors. No, there. no, 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 not at all. It's very, it's, cor- it's very accurate. <laughs> it's it's completely not a dig. It's 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 just a, an absolute fact. They the American actors can access emotion much more readily uh, and use it in a way that uh, is very different from a UK actor, really is. I mean, you know, you'll find an exception on both sides, of course you will, but there's a fundamental, that's that's the difference. Um, uh, and that was the thing that, that I found most challenging in the rehearsal room in America, was going, why are you crying? Stop crying. And they go, but we cry. Don't you get it? That's what happens over here. <laughs> no, no. Um, and uh, and actually, uh, the, what we found was a sort of point that, that captured sort of both sides, I think. You know, the, the sort of emotional stakes are heightened in the American production. There's no question about it. And, uh, and it's neither better nor worse. It's just different. And, and for me, that was the that was the thing I had to come to terms with. Really, was that that the emotional drive is greater. Um, not always to my taste. That was the other thing. You know, there, there was a point at which I had to go. Okay, my taste may be for something slightly different here, but I've got to work with what we have, not what I want them to be. It goes back to that conversation about parameters. You know, if they're working within my parameters, I then have to go. So. Okay, this is what you're giving me. Now I'm I'm going to try and encourage you to move it over here, so it's here, not stop you, but just let's try this. Um, uh, and and that was what was sort of extraordinary about it. And the audience reaction, likewise, it's exactly the same. I mean, in the UK, the audiences are very passionate about it, but in a British way. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, they were always very enthusiastic, lots of clapping, but it's mayhem some nights in America. Absolute craziness uh, in a way you would never get in the UK. You really just wouldn't. <laughs> I apologize for throw, uh, uh, interrupting you, Michael. You can ask your next question if you want. <laughs> no, I, I just want to say that the woman sitting next to me, that the line about him being funded by the CIA, she did not see that coming in any capacity <laughs> and had a visceral reaction next to me yeah. um it was it was fantastic to both see it and then have that happen right next to me <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's really different it's really really different uh yeah it's it's extraordinary i'm going to tell you one little thing which is quite funny sure. if i may Go for it, Giles. It's a show. You, you, you're the guest. You can do whatever you want. We're just the hosts. <laughs> well, that's very sweet of you. Um, the uh, there's a line right right at the beginning of the the play when Amir is narrating and he talks about um, Hassan's mother, 
um, uh, uh, you know, uh, had uh, it was a fate worse than death running off with a group of actors and musicians. Um, so, uh, and, and this is a big laugh line in America. You know, you know, this actors and musicians, you know. and, and and in the UK, that this line says, "On a fate worse than death." And what you have in the UK is basically six hundred people going, "Yeah, that's absolutely right. It is a fate worse than death." Uh, you know, and that that's a sort of fundamental difference between us. You know, we're we're going, "Yep, yeah, terrible." In America, it's a hoot. It's an absolute hoot. Um, and so there are all sorts of laughs in it that were never there before. Just not. Um, so I would sit in the audience going, I just don't, what's happened now? <laughs> Why are they all laughing at this? But it's, it's different. It's just different. Uh, Is it hard thrilling. for opening night? Is it hard on opening night as a director? Because you can put all your heart and soul and try and get the best out of your actors, best out of your performers. And at the end of the day, when, when the show opens, it's in God's hands now, and I'm not a religious man, so I, I would I'd usually say it's in Iron Man's hands now, but it's in God's hands now, and you have to sort of sit back and say, okay, I can only bring it to X. The actors and the performers have to bring it to Y and Z. So as the director, when you're sitting in the audience, whether it be in the West End or in Broadway, how hard is it to let go, to finally say, okay, I have to step back and it's up to them now it's I, I can only go as far as opening night when that curtain goes up uh it's okay i'm okay with that i'm okay with that um uh, i i think learn something uh, new every day giles <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I think the i think the the real thing is that if you've done your job properly uh what you'll find is that some of those things that you've been saying to a company over the rehearsal period, if you step away for a while, some you know they haven't done them. You know, they're not happening for whatever reason. They've, they've gone somewhere else. You've tried 28 times to say this thing. It's not worked. You've gone, oh, well, fair enough. I've just given in on that one. If you come back three weeks later, you'll find quite a lot of that stuff starts to happen because going back to the earlier point, if you've done your job properly, yeah, you know, they're they're thinking about all sorts of things. They're making choices, and somewhere along the line, somewhere in the back of their mind, they go, "Oh, actually, do you know, maybe that was right. That thing that was said to me three weeks ago." Um, and so there's a really fascinating process that happens. I think when you go back to a show, uh, one is those things that you kept saying that has now started to happen. You go, "Oh, great, they got it. They found it." But they're also then doing other things which you've never seen before, and you go. Oh, well, that's great. That's really interesting choice. That's a good choice. I, okay, I can work with that. Of course, there's a few moments in every show where you'll see the director with their head in their hands, you know, going, why have they done that? What on earth is that actor up to? Why? Just why did he do that? Um, uh, but, you know, hell, that's part of the fun of it. <laughs> Michael, over to you for your last question. Then we're just cautious of time here. So we'll start wrapping up here. But Michael, last question for Giles. <laughs> yeah, I, I, because I was curious when it was coming to Broadway, uh, it coming as kind of a limited run versus an open ended show. Um, I guess my, I guess my question is kind of what went into that process to decide that this was going to serve itself better as a limited run versus open ended? Okay. I like that well, question. Think, uh, Just imagine I <laughs> asked that question so I look smart. <laughs> um, well, you're going to be impressed with the answer. Then uh, it, imagine me answering the question too, so I really look smart. <laughs> um, okay, so the first thing is that um, it's a risky show. I mean, whatever happens, it's a risky show. I mean, there was a point uh, during the run where there were only two plays on Broadway all the rest were musicals and the other play was Harry Potter uh so you know it's a risky show it's a very serious piece of work that goes on for two and x number of hours uh with you know no no songs I mean you know we're asking people to come to a play um so that's that's tough on Broadway I think and you can do it but but from the producer's point of view having a limited season 
gave them a sort of safe space, if you like. And they were also doing it over the summer, which is the worst yeah. possible time. Yeah. Uh, uh, so they were very brave. Um, they took a punt on it. Uh, and they were also very clear that they were looking to challenge Broadway practice to some degree. Um, you know, they were looking to take a risk with the company you know, that they were having on stage. They were looking to work with charity, you know, with charities so that they were raising money doing it for all these causes. So, you know, it, every ticket, you know, a contribution goes towards three or four charities, which is fantastic. Um you know, they were wanting to, you know, they were very serious about the whole COVID issue. They reintroduced masked performances. You know, they were very brave about how they approached the whole thing. Um, but also they rolled the tour into the funding. So when they went to their backer, what they said was, we need this amount of money um, and to get the show on broadway but we're not but we also want to tour it so we're spreading your risk yeah um so if the show gets good enough reviews good enough audience response and the tour bookers like it you won't have to put any more money in we'll take it out with the money that you've got you've given us um, and that was the smartest move of all. So what that's meant for them is that they haven't had to look at the 17 weeks as a way of recouping. Uh, the 17 weeks, if you like, was the loss leader for the tour. And I know that part of their thinking, and there's no guarantee this will happen, there really isn't, but part of their thinking is that it's, you know, if it has a, it has a successful Broadway run for 17 weeks and then it has a successful tour it could always come back yeah it could always come back um you know with all the publicity and word of mouth that it would need to support it through another run again probably a short season but you know that's that's a very smart commercial approach tied into a sort of social concern that they have signed performances they've been having you know all sorts of things so they've been really really terrific i think uh, in their sort of forward thinking uh, around the show uh, it's a and i think in some ways it's challenged broadway practice uh, yeah and that's a great thing that was an amazing answer i just gave i just can't believe it yeah <laughs> you, are, you are very very good you know it <laughs> Um, I, I want to sort of start wrapping up, but I want to start with this question because um, Michael is producing, directing as well. There are people who listen to our show just because of him, because we talk about theater a lot. What advice would you give to someone who is just starting out, who might be that 19 year old kid going, you know what, I want to start getting into this because I think my passion is the theater. What would your advice be to those kids right now or even that 38 year old who's going you know what i want to take my talents and go to broadway or go to my local theater company what advice would you give them wow okay um, deep stuff to, to end the interview yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I, I i i have spent a lot of my career giving people advice about what to do um and um i don't know that it's changed very much over the years, but there are two things that won't work as well for the 38 year old. Um, but the first is if you're the 19 year old, be in a theater, it doesn't matter. Just meet people. If you're front of house, you know, you're know, you doing the box office, you're behind the bar, you're, I mean, wherever you are. Um, because relationships are what gives you a career. You know, doesn't matter how much talent you've got. If you don't have the relationships, uh, it won't work for you, or unless you're really lucky. Um, slightly different for actors, maybe, but uh, you know, it's about who you meet, who you get to know, who are the other people. My career, all the way through my career, um, and I am confident when I say this about uh, what happens with other people, you make relationships early on which you retain. 
you know, there are people I work with now, people I keep in touch with, writers, directors, they've, you know, those that have retained their careers, we still work together, we still talk about stuff, we still support each other in this world that way. So get to know people, really important, because there'll be a whole bunch of other people out there you can share ideas with, be creative. The, the other thing I would say, uh, I guess, is that... Um, this is stupid, but true. Go and see work that you wouldn't think you should go and see. You know, go to see something in a basement or in a, you know, or in an attic or in a, you know, go and see, just go and see weird stuff. Go and see stuff you don't think you'll like because it's the simplest thing in the world to go to the same thing over and over again. Um, or a version of the same thing but actually what you need to do is be challenged challenged creatively and you get to a point in your life and this i say i would say is true for the 38 year old you'll get to a point in your life where you're just doing the same thing and actually there are other people out there doing things that are more interesting than you and find out who they are and learn from them there'll always be somebody more interesting than you as you've to have discovered today there's a... <laughs> 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 well, on that note, Giles, my last question I was about to say, you've had an extensive career that has spanned many decades, decades and you've oh, had it now over. <laughs> you've had, no, but honestly, you've had a, an amazing career that has spanned uh, many decades. You have been you've had shows on West End. You have now had a show on Broadway. What's next the, to wrap this all up? What does the future hold for Giles Croft? Oh, well, now there's an interesting thing. Uh, I, I have three projects. Um, I mean, the only work I have coming up, paid work I have coming up, is in universities. Well, that's fine. I'm, you know, it's nice, fun thing to do. I like doing that. Um, but I have three projects underway, uh, uh, none of which have uh, close enough to being confirmed yet. But I don't, I'm perfectly happy to tell you what they are. They're not really... Uh, it doesn't matter whether you know or not. Is um, one of them but, about uh, two podcast hosts, one in America, one in Canada. They talk about a director in the UK. <laughs> it's like it's it's prime for West End. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> I have to say, it does sound like a bloody good idea to me. I'll, 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 go, I'll go for that. <laughs> um, no, I'm working on a pro project about a, a painter uh, called Gluck, G-L-U-C-K, who was a British artist artist of the 20s and 30s, through to the 60s, really, um, who's really fascinating. Do look Gluck up. And what makes Gluck interesting is that uh, she uh, chose to remove gender and she just called her, she, she was called Hannah Gluckstein and she chose to call herself Gluck. And uh, in this day of sort of gender fluidity and uh, gender identity, uh, Gluck raises all sorts of really interesting questions about how people were dealing with the same issues. And she was quite public about it. I mean, she wouldn't have identified as anything other than, uh, I think, uh, a lesbian. You know, she wouldn't have gone further than that because there wouldn't have been much further to go, I guess, for her. But she dressed as a man. No question about that. Um, uh, uh, and so I'm working on a project about that. It's just a really fascinating uh, way of looking at those questions through a sort of historical perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to think I'm not going to read too much into the fact that you're doing a show based on paint after just talking about how you love smell of paint and love sniffing glue. But I would never say that to you, Giles, because I'm a nice host and that's where I sit. Um, I do, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I do want to just say uh, best of luck. I, I know I'm not sure what you're supposed to say to theater people. And I know I'm very overly dramatic with my hands right now. I don't know why I'm just going to put them down, but I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for sitting down for the last 50 minutes and chatting about your career, chatting about the kite runner, giving advice to that 38 year old, talking about your love of sniffing paint in the back of the uh, theater. It has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show and talk and just, just pick your brain for this long. So thank you so much. It's been fun. I've enjoyed it very much. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I hope you all have a very nice evening. I... The, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so with that, as I say all the time, thank you for tuning into the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Uh, put down your social media feed, put down Twitter, put down Instagram, put down TikTok, put down Facebook, and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.